Praise the Lord, everybody. What a wonderful day it has been today. So grateful to the Lord for another opportunity to come into your homes, even your automobiles, wherever you might be. I want to thank you right now for making time for this fellowship and allowing me to share God's word with you. It's been snowing for a while, and I know many of us have been in the house. I'm here in my office, and I've been praying and preparing to share with you on today, and I'm excited. Don't know how you feel, and I'm also grateful for God's keeping power. want to give uh, the saints an opportunity to come on in and join us as we get ready to go into God's holy word. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we want to thank you for this another day. Lord, this is the day that you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Had it not been for you, Lord, we wouldn't be here. And we're so grateful. And we ask that you would bless us as we go into your word. Touch us one by one, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm grateful, as forestated, the Lord has been good to us. Yes, he has. And we are continuing on with our series. Uh, We've been talking about the church. Let's talk about the church. And um, the Lord has been blessing us. We started in chapter 3, and we talked about the fact that Pastor Paul in his teaching to the Ephesian congregation, uh, he talks about the church in three ways. Uh, he says the church is the body, the temple, and the mystery. And as in other series, we started at the end and we're making our way up to the top. So we started with mystery. Chapter three, uh, the church uh, is a mystery. And Last week, we were in chapter two, uh, church as a temple, a mystery, a temple. uh, And now we are ending with the first analogy of the church that Pastor Paul gives as he talks about the church as being the body of Christ. The theme, of course, as we rehash the theme of uh, the book of Ephesians is Christ and the church. And we understand through looking through his writings and uh, feeling the pastor's heart and understanding his theme, the thrust or the purpose of his writing to this Gentile church uh, was to push them to advance. I don't just want you uh, to be tongue talkers or I don't just want you to sit around the church. I, I want you to grow. Uh, did not he write on one occasion, grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he wanted them to advance in faith, love, wisdom, and in revelation of our Father, uh, the Father of glory. We find that in uh, this chapter that we're going to be reading out of chapter one and we'll go through it verses 15 through 17 so on tonight we are in chapter one and we'll be talking about the church let's talk about the church shall we let's get into this lesson now um as for stated we're in the book of ephesians the very first chapter uh, and I'm so, I'm really excited. I've been excited about this lesson and talking about the church. You know, so many people have so many different opinions and concepts and beliefs about what the church really is. Uh, so this is a good discussion to have, and I'm sure that it'll be recurring and we'll come back uh, and and talk about the church. Uh, but the Apostle Paul begins... Uh, this particular chapter, chapter one. Um, now, uh, before I go too quickly, let's let's read the anchor scripture first, and then we'll go back and give you a brief uh, view, uh, overview of the chapter before we dive into the subject matter. But here, 
uh, the anchor scripture. We're in chapter one, of course, but the anchor scripture verses uh, would be verses 20 through 23. Let me read it in your hearing and then we'll, we'll move on. Ephesians chapter one, verses 20 through 23 which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So here we are uh, in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians and Paul begins this particular chapter. I would call it, let's call it the first section, chapter one, verses three. Uh, through 14, he begins with the word of blessing to God. Beginning, a, it's, it's a long sentence. When you read it in the Greek, it's a long sentence in the original Greek, which continues for several verses, and he's emphasizing uh, several things. Um, and I won't read all of the verses, but we'll, we will highlight certain verses as I give you a quick overview. Uh, but the first section in it involves verses 3 through 14, uh, and he's actually beginning with the word of blessing, right? He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God uh, to the saints that are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you. He's doing a, a salutation and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed uh, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And he says he has chosen us, verse 4, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. He chose us before the foundation. And that's key. Before you were even here, before the, the world was created, Hallelujah. He already knew us and we had been chosen before the foundation of the world was laid. Hallelujah. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So uh, as he writes to this Gentile church, by the time he gets to verse number five, he's emphasizing what's called predestination, right? He says it in verse five, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So uh, Paul is saying he knew that you were a Gentile before you were born a Gentile, and he had already come up with a plan for you to be adopted in to the family. He already knew you. He already had a plan. You were predestined to be here. You were predestined to be a Holy Ghost sanctified believer. He already knew me. He already knew me. Put it in the comment section. He already knew who I was. Hallelujah. That means he knew who you were, what you were going to do, how many curses would come out of your mouth, how many cigarettes you would smoke, how long you would be on drugs, how much sinning you would do, how many pitfalls you would have in your life, and he saved you anyway. Yes, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Before the foundation of the world was laid, he had already decided that you would be a part of the household of faith. My God, I love this word. Hallelujah. So he, he tells them, he hits it. I want you to know that you're here because God had already made a way for you to be here. God knew me before creation, uh, that he would choose a certain people to be his followers, to be his children, right? Ephesians um, 1 and 4. Uh, let's look at it. Mm -hmm. According as he hath chosen us 
in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So uh, he highlights also the importance of grace. Hallelujah. You remember grace, right? Uh, in Ephesians 1 and 6, uh, he says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. Because of his grace, that which would normally be unacceptable, he made us acceptable. Hallelujah. He made us accepted in the beloved. So he highlights predestination. He highlights grace, God's unmerited favor. And then Paul reminds the readers, he reminds the Gentiles of the redemption Hallelujah, through the blood of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1 and, and 7. Let's read it. I'll read it for you. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 and 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. This is why uh, the next few verses I'm going to read, uh, proves why I'm saying it would overlap. The verses or the chapters would overlap. We said he talks about the church as being the body, the temple, and a mystery. We started with mystery. Last week we talked about it in the second chapter as being uh, the temple. And now we're going to segue into the fact that he says the church is the body of Christ. But here, uh, he talks about in chapter one about the revelation of God's mystery through Jesus as the fulfillment of God's plan. It, it, it's a mystery. Hallelujah. It's really a mystery to us, but it was all along God's plan that you and I would be brought in to this family. So uh, he says in verses nine and 10, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So he's, he's alluding to the fulfillment of this mystery. Uh, it's all in him the desire was him in him the purpose is in him hallelujah who he would save who he would choose it was all in him and i'm so glad before i got here i was on his mind i was in his will uh, i was in his desire i'm saved because he desired to save me he loved me before i was here with an everlasting love he told Jeremiah, I want you to know I loved you with an everlasting love. So uh, let's hasten on because later on in this chapter, Paul would describe the inheritance. In verse 11, he described not only are you in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, not only um, have you been predestined, not only now uh, are you uh, predestined to be here. Not only uh, are you here because of God's grace, not only uh, are you a product of his redemptive power. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited. You are a product of his redemptive power, but I want you to know that you have an inheritance. Hallelujah. You have an inheritance. Verse 11, chapter one, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Listen, uh, he already knew what he wanted to do in my life. He didn't go visit anyone. He didn't sit in anybody's office and get their advice. He already knew who he would save, who he would bless, who he would deliver. He already knew. Come on, put it in the comment section one more time. He already knew me. He knew how he wanted to save me, how he wanted to deliver, to deliver me. He already knew. And he has given me an inheritance and which results which results in the glory of God. Verse 12, 
Lord, I love your word. Verse 12 of chapter 1, he says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So Paul's readers, you and I, or the Ephesian church, those Gentiles who had been persuaded uh, to be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had received the gift of the Holy Ghost. He is now teaching them concerning who they are, how they got there. Hallelujah. In spite of people's opinions, even in spite of how they felt about themselves, in spite of the labels society put on them, God already knew whom would be saved. So we have an inheritance. Hallelujah. And he says, when they heard and believed in the gospel, verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed hallelujah, with the Holy Spirit of promise. So uh, you didn't shake the preacher's hand. You didn't do the sinner's prayer. You didn't repeat after anyone. You heard the gospel of of Jesus Christ, and you said yes to his will, and just like the promise said, hallelujah, you repented, you were baptized in the name Jesus Christ, and for the remission of your sins, and you received the gift of the Holy Ghost. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It was a promise, hallelujah. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke of. And when Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, hallelujah, he makes reference to that testimony or to that prophecy that Joel spoke of. And he said, the promise is unto you. The promise is unto you. The promise is unto you and to your children and to generations afar off the whole house. I've been saying it for a few years now, and it's coming to pass, the whole house. You were sealed with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of promise, and the Spirit, according to God's word, is a guarantee of the believer's future heavenly hope, a down payment, a down. The Holy Ghost is a down payment on future things. Hallelujah. The 14th verse which is the earnest of our inheritance. Think about uh, purchasing something, and before you purchase it, you have to put a down payment on it. The Holy Ghost is a down payment, hallelujah, on a future heavenly hope. That's another lesson that I feel good in my soul talking about the Holy Ghost and the fact that God has put this deposit in me. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, and as good as it feels, as powerful as the Holy Spirit is, Paul said it's a down payment for future hope, a future heavenly hope. My Lord, if it's this good now, hallelujah, and I hear the word of God speaking in my spirit, I have not seen, neither hath the ear heard, hallelujah, nor has it entered into the hearts of men, Hallelujah, all that he has, and I'm paraphrasing now, all that he has prepared for them that love him. So um, let's move on. I'm feeling good in my spirit. Predestination uh, is a clear theme, you would say, in this section. It is a clear theme in this section, uh, and it, it's... It spoke of twice in verse 5 and in verse 11. Verse 5, Ephesians 1 and 5, he says, having predestinated us into or unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. But in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Who, who told God to do it? He told himself. Who advised God to do it? He advised himself. <laughs> who gave God permission to save you? He doesn't need anybody's permission. He had the authority to do it and he made an executive decision. I'm going to save her. I'm going to deliver her. I feel the Holy Ghost in my office right now. I feel like screaming out loud. 
God chose us. Hallelujah. God chose us. God chose us. Put it in the comment section. God chose me. God chose me. I didn't deserve it. Hallelujah. But he chose me. So uh, the readers of this book, of this epistle, uh, specifically so, the Gentile believers, those who have been born again, hallelujah, he said you were adopted, you were grafted in because of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to verse five, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Who signed the papers, Jesus? What did he use to sign it with? His own blood. We are now brought nigh because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he did this because there are certain purposes. There, He says in verse 11, again, we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So, um, and, and let's dig a little deeper in this because this is where um, we get into that eternal, uh, that eternal security or, or the fact that God has made it so. He has already chosen you. Um, and so these words strongly support the teaching of eternal security, but I don't want people to feel like when I say eternal security, it means that uh, once I get the Holy Ghost, I can live any way I want to live. I can go back into a world of sin uh, and the Lord will understand and I'll make it in anyway. Nope. How can you neglect so great a salvation? You cannot have God and the world at the same time. That's another lesson, but let's dig further in the word of God because uh, the doctrine that a person who truly believes in Jesus for salvation uh, cannot be separated from his love. But sin, sin can separate you. Don't you know he loved Adam and Eve? But sin separated them from him. And salvation is all about reconciliation and bringing us back in to the fellowship. But let's read Romans, the eighth chapter. Verses 37 through 39, he says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now uh, we have quickly given you an overview of the first section of chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. By the time Paul gets into the 15th verse, we have moved into the second movement or the second section of this chapter. So we're starting in verse 15. In this section, uh, if we section it correctly and rightly dividing the word of God, it's verses 15 through verse 23. And it sounds like this. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks unto you, making mention of you in my prayer. So now, Paul is letting them know, yes, you've been saved and I've explained predestination and all of these good things, but I want you to know that I'm praying for you constantly. Why? Because I don't want you to leave. I don't want you uh, to fall underneath the pressure that comes, hallelujah, because your life now contradicts what the world has been trying to dictate to you, hallelujah, because when you're saved, you're no longer, hallelujah, a part of this world system as it relates to soul and life and allegiance. I belong to God now. I'm no longer my own, but I belong to Jesus. I belong to Christ. So now 
Uh, he wants them to know, I've been praying for you because I want you to grow. I want you to advance. I want you to be rooted and grounded like he told the Colossians, rooted and grounded in him. So uh, here we are starting the second section. And uh, he says, I, I, I don't stop giving thanks for you, always mentioning you in my prayers. Verse 17, that the God of all, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give unto you. Listen, he says, I want God to give you wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him. And I want the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you would know which is the hope of his calling and that the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he writes on and keeps writing through verse 23. And I put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So he say, I'm praying for you. And this is what I pray to the Lord daily concerning you, because I know it's difficult. There are people who are upset because of your salvation, people you used to hang out with, people even who considered you hopeless, who considered you a nothing, a nobody, who had given up on you. Yes, people who never expected you to have this kind of joy, to have this kind of happiness, people who never expected you, and not only people, but the enemy himself who has an attitude. He's angry now because that which belonged to him now belongs to Jesus. Remember that song, Now I Belong to Jesus and Jesus Belongs to Me? Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Not just for now, and I'm paraphrasing, but for all eternity. He said, I'm praying for you. Hallelujah. I'm praying for you, my brother, my sister, that you'd hang in there and that you'll stay with God. He said, I'm praying for you every single day. 16th verse, she says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I don't know if he knew them name by name. Hallelujah. But I would imagine he said, Lord, bless the people of God there in Ephesus. Bless this congregation. And pastors do that, you know, when they love the people that they're serving. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the people of God here in Washington, D.C., Hallelujah, your lambs, your children. Bless those, oh God, at RTA. Bless the, the sheep, Lord. Touch them, oh God. Touch their hearts, touch their minds. That's how pastors pray for those that they serve. And he said, I'm praying for you. Hallelujah, I never cease to make mention of you in my prayers. And I want God, hallelujah, Oh, my Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, I want him to give you wisdom. I want him to give you a deeper revelation of who he is. Hallelujah. Listen, he's not praying, Lord, let them speak in tongues more and more. Let them run around the church more. He said, no, Lord, take them deeper in you, deeper in you. Listen, yes, and I hear what David said. In his psalm, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He's praying that they receive wisdom and knowledge. Uh, and his words are extending now into a praise of God for his great might. Listen to what he says in verse 19. And what is the excellent greatness of his power toward us? This is a strong prayer. Who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So he says, I'm praying for you daily. And I want God to give you wisdom and knowledge. I want you to have a deeper revelation uh, of who he is. And listen, you don't get that uh, on a praise break, having a praise break every five minutes. No, you get a revelation of him through meditation and contemplation on his word and having a relationship with your savior. Take him deeper, Lord. 
Give them an understanding of your word. Hallelujah. Speak into their hearts and to their minds. And he talks about the fact that I want them even to be saved long enough. Hallelujah. That they would make it through uh, all the way up to that part where they are resurrected until they, they experience that, that change. Yes. Uh, live for God. Die in him and rise up with him. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's all part of my salvation. Hallelujah. He didn't just save me to live down here, but he saved me so I could be with him in glory. So he makes reference to that in the 20th verse, chapter one, which he wrought in Christ. Listen to this. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now listen, what happened when Jesus went and sat down on the right hand? Of the throne, the Holy Ghost fell. He double shot. The Holy Ghost fell. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. We're getting ready to have church in here tonight. Yes, we are. So he talks about resurrection and he talks about the exalted status of our Savior. Yes, he does. Talks about that Ephesians 1 and 21. He says, far above all principality and power, might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. He talks about the authority of Christ and he's setting us up now. Yes, he is because he's revealing our position in him and he's revealing Christ's position in our lives, his authority. Verse 22, 1 and 22, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. You know what I say before I preach and when we would come together uh, in the house of God, and I'd get ready to minister, I'd say I give honor to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the boss. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He's, why is he the boss? Because he put everything under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things. He's the God of the universe. He's not just, hallelujah, over my life, but he is the God of the universe. He's running the show. Hallelujah. Every falling star, every comet, he knows about it. He sets everything in motion. Hallelujah. He set the earth on his axis, spun it on his finger and set it in place. He is the boss. I love his word. So he talks about the authority of Christ in verse 22. And now he moves from our position in Christ and Christ's position being over us, now he moves to the significance of the church. Hmm. Hallelujah, the significance of the church. And he starts hitting it in verse 22. And here is where we are. He put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Who's the church? We the church, excuse my English. We the church, <laughs> which is his body. We are the church, which is, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Remember that hymn, it's all in him. It's all in him. It's all in him. Yes, it's all in him. Now let's talk about the church. Because Paul did all that talking. I told you in the beginning, he writes in the original Greek, he gives this a long dissertation. Yes, he's put us in heavenly places. He has saved us. And by the way, he knew he was going to save you before your mama gave birth to you, before the foundations of the world 
were laid, before he set the foundation of the earth, before he put the clouds in the sky, before he put the moon and the sun in its place, before all of that happened, before, hallelujah, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy, he knew, my God, I feel like preaching, he knew that he was going to save my dirty soul. And hallelujah, he has authority. He's the boss. He controls everything. He has the last word. He has the authority and he has put me in his church. Let me tell you something. Nobody can put you out the church if God has brought you in. Nobody can put you. They can put you out the building but they can't put you out of the church. The church doesn't belong to man. The church belongs to Jesus. Yes, the pastor may hold the deed. Yes, and I know uh, you have some situations where the, the pastor holds the deed. He bought the building, but he did not purchase the church. Hallelujah. The church was purchased with the blood of of Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about the church. Verses 22, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, <laughs> which is his body, the fullest of him that filleth all. I'm trying, I'm trying to calm down, but the Holy Ghost is in here with me and I feel like having church. So for the first time, for the first time now, and I know we started in chapter three, but now, and we've gone backwards, but now we're here in chapter one, and this is where he mentions for the first time the word church. And, it, and, it, it, and I'll be honest, because we just went through a whole lot before we got here, before we got to church, we had to go through a whole lot. Before we got to be a part of the church, we had to go through a whole lot uh, so he took some time to get to this point. He took his time. He took his time. Uh, so, and he doesn't take his time because he 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 doesn't want us to feel like the church is important. It is important, uh, but he's doing this because the church is important. He wants you to know uh, some of the things that were involved just to get you to be where you are. Uh, so. He uses this, and by the time he gets to verses 22 and 23, he's reaching a climax. Hallelujah. He did all that talking to get us to the church. Hallelujah. So in Ephesus, Paul has poured out his praise to God for them. I'm thanking God for them. I'm praising God for the blessings, the plan of God, the purpose of God. Hallelujah. And he lets them know as a pastor, I'm praying for you daily because I want you, hallelujah, to get wisdom of God. I want the word of God to rest in your bosom. I want you to receive revelation of God, who he is, what he can do. I want you to grow in the knowledge of of him and the strength of God. Hallelujah. I want you to be filled with all the fullness of God. So he's reaching this climatic part of his prayer and in his climax, how I would imagine uh, he's not only writing, but he's getting excited. He's sitting, he's sitting under house arrest. Hallelujah. A rented house. He's being held there and he's getting, could you imagine while he's raising his hands and uh, I don't know if he was chained at this particular time. I know history says he had chains around uh, his wrist and his ankles and his waist. And there were at uh, three different times of day, there were soldiers standing there and they were told if he tries to escape, run him through with the sword. But he would look them in the face and say, I'm not your prisoner, but I'm the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's taking time to minister to minister to these Gentiles, to tell them, hallelujah, I'm praying for you day after day, thanking God for your salvation. And I want to remind you that there's more to God. Uh, go deeper and deeper and deeper in him. And his climax is the church. <laughs> you are the church. You are the church. Now understand because he's not in the church building 
And if you want to know uh, the correct historical positioning of this, there was no temple at this time. There was no Ephesian temple at this time. These were letters that were going from house to house. Holly, so for those of you who need a building, your church building, they call it church. Nope. Uh, the early church at this particular time didn't have a particular building as of yet, uh, but they were the church, the church. We are the church. So the first thing he has to say about the church, um, he wants them to know it, it matters. You, you are the church. Don't let anybody make you feel like you're not part of the church because you have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So. Uh, why does Paul bother to say all of this? How? Because they needed to hear it. They needed to know who they were, what they were a part of. They needed to know that no one has a right to tell you you're not supposed to be here. Not when God already knew uh, he was going to save you before you got here, before you were born. Hallelujah. He knew you, your mama, your papa. He knew the circumstances of your birth. He knew you before you knew yourself. And here you are, a child of the Most High God. And hallelujah, to get you in here, he had to put everything under his feet. Principalities, demonic powers, accusers of your life demons that would come to the Lord and say, she doesn't deserve your Holy Ghost. She's nothing. She was born in sin. She's on her way to hell, but grace told the devil to shut up. Hallelujah. I knew her before she got here. And I've already made up my mind that I would save her. Listen, that's why the Bible makes reference to the fact that I couldn't even get to him unless he had already extended an invitation. Listen, so that means even before I heard the word, the altar call had already been given. My God, I'm feeling this in my spirit. I took and placed everything under my feet. I conquered everything I needed to conquer. I already had a plan. Hallelujah. And I became head over all things to the church to the church which is his body the church which is his body the fulfillment of the one who was being fulfilled in all things in every way so the first thing then the first thing the first thing he says about the church is Christ Christ Jesus Christ first thing to say about the church is Christ. It's all in him. <laughs> Hallelujah. There are three things to say about Christ in the church. He's the head over everything. He's the boss. Come on. The first thing you have to say, if you're going to put the, everything is about Christ. Everything is about Christ. Not the pastor, not the missionary president. If you're really going to be church, Christ, Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ. So the first thing he says, three things he says about Christ. Number one, he's the head of everything. He is the boss. The second thing he makes reference to, and he says that uh, Christ is for the church. Christ is the boss and he's for the church. And the third thing is the church is for Christ. Let me say it again. Verses 22 and 23, he says, Jesus is the boss. He is the head of the church. He has put everything under his feet. He's in charge. He is over everything. The second thing after he says he's over everything, he says Christ is for the church. And then he says the church is for Christ. Christ is over all the first thing. So before we come to talk about Christ and the church, we need to remember uh, that Jesus is is the boss. Everything in his body, everything is subject to him. I think sometimes we forget that. <laughs> we try, we try, we try to put Jesus out as if we're going to tell him what to do. But this is his church. We are his church. We are 
in the body. Everything has been put under his feet, which means he's in control. He's in control. So this is reverence to, uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, and, and let me pull it out. In the book of Psalms, Psalms number eight. Can I take my time with this? I, and I'm going to try not to hold you. I'm going to try not to hold you too late. But I declare uh, in, the, in the book of Psalms, this is what he says. Uh, and, and when Paul makes reference to this, um, it, it is believed that he's, he's making reference to something that's already been recorded even before Paul became a part of the body. It was already spoken. It, it was like a messianic psalm. He says in, in, in uh, the eighth psalm, O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name. In all the earth who has set the glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him listen. It's a messianic psalm because by the time he gets to verse five, he's talking about Jesus. <laughs> he's talking about my savior. The Old Testament songwriter is singing prophetically now in verse five, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things, here we are, verse six, thou hast put all things under his feet. My goodness, O oh Lord my God, how excellent is thy name. So he's reminding us now, Paul is saying yes, uh, this is the one, <laughs> Jesus, the Messiah. This is his church. He has put it. And he says, I'm not talking about a building, the church, his body. Hallelujah. So he's, he's ruler over creation. He's ruler over every nation. I don't care what the dictator's name is. He's ruler over the universe. Hallelujah. Galaxy after galaxy. He runs the whole gamut of anything that has been created. It has been created by him. He is, say it with me, Jesus is the boss. He's the boss. He's in control. My goodness. So Paul is, he is quoting out of the book of Psalms. Hallelujah. He's bringing us into a new dimension, giving us a revelation concerning the church, the body. Uh, and he's letting us know that it's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. Hallelujah. It's all about Jesus Christ. So Christ, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, uh, the fulfillment of God's plan for the universe. Everything, everything. What does everything mean? Everything. Everything is under his feet. That means Christ is the head, the ruler over all things. Uh, so, and it's, it's not a new idea then. No, he's just reiterating something that's already been sung, already been prophesied. And in verse 10, chapter one of Ephesians, he's saying these words, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in, I wish I had the time really to dig as deeply as I would be here for a long time because there's so much meat right in that verse number 10. So, uh, he's saying that Christ, everything is about Jesus. Everything is about Christ. Hallelujah. Church. You can't have a church without Christ. You can't have a church without Christ. And if you're not in his body, you're not in the church. I don't care the name about the name that's written outside that door. I don't care how many members are inside the building. If you're not in Christ, you are not in the church. If Christ is not in you, 
you are not in his church, not the church that Jesus built. So he says it in verse number 10, chapter one, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together and what all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. Then that's the first thing now we've covered. Uh, the first thing he says about the church is Christ. <laughs> that's all Jesus. He's the reason why we're here. Hashanda Glory to God. We are his body, the church, which is his body, Christ. Now, the second thing is Christ is for the church. Ephesians 1 and 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So uh, Jesus Christ, the pinnacle of the universe, the pinnacle and focus, the pinnacle and focus and the center of God's plan for the entire universe is for the church. God gave him to be the head over all things. The rule of the universe then is for us, his church. He's for us. This is an amazing truth. Hallelujah. A gift beyond imagination, which gives us strength to live in the face of adversity in the face of demonic powers, in the face of all that would come against us, hallelujah, anything that would try to, to frighten us or defend us or tear us down, hallelujah, Christ is for the church. You might need a little help with this. This is why he told us in Romans, if God be for us, who, asha, who can be against us. So, and I hear you talking to me tonight. I hear you talking. How did God give Christ to the church? Because the second thing Paul says in that, that latter end of this chapter is Christ is for the church. So how did God give Jesus to the church? Uh, he gave me him. He gave us him on the cross. He gave us him. I know my English is wrong, but my heart is right. He gave, he gave us him on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him as a sacrifice. Hasanda, hallelujah. That, and Jesus dying on the cross, he was both priest and sacrifice. And he reached up and said, Lord, why, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He was giving us, giving his son to us as a sacrifice. He died on the cross. That was how he, that's how he gave Jesus to us. I'm going to give him to you. You can't make it into heaven without, without Jesus. I'm going to give him to you. Hashandabu, hallelujah. Christ is for the church. So the word, the word church here uh, in this connotation means gathering. Hallelujah. Gathering, gathering, a gathering of people gathering of souls. Paul says it like this because it's not just, and listen to my notes, Paul says it like this because it's not just that God has given Christ to each of us individually so that we can each be strengthened by ourselves, uh, but he has given Christ to us together. That's why I'm saying you can't have church without Christ, without him being in us. And Paul said he's for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's for us. He's for us. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Why? Because I'm for you. I'm for you. So uh, the idea then of us being gathered together, even in the pandemic, we're still gathering together. We're still connected. Hallelujah. On Facebook and Zoom and on YouTube with we're coming together. This is why we can't afford to play church. We can't afford to play games with this, even with virtual worship. We're coming together. We're connecting. Holly and the Holy Ghost, listen, the Holy Ghost can shoot through wires and the Holy Ghost can, can be here in my house, in my office, and in your, your bedroom at the same time. Christ is for the church. So the fact of us coming together really matters. It, it matters. 
it matters because we can come together as people of God. One, yes, uh, two chasing a thousand, ten chasing ten thousand. We can come together. You can get together with your brothers and sisters and binding on earth so it's bound in heaven, loosing on earth so it's loosed in heaven. Uh, and and Paul, Paul is saying this to us. Christ is Hallelujah is the center of the church, the first thing, and Christ is for the church. And the third thing he says is the church is for Christ. Hallelujah. Not, not only is he for us, but we are for him. Listen, he paid for us. Even before he died on the cross, he prayed for us. Before he died, he prayed for me. Yes, he did. He prayed for me before he died and said, Lord, make them one. You have given them to me and I want you to make them one. And after he died on the cross, he went and sat on the right hand of the throne and he's still praying. Hasha, he's still praying for me, making intercession for me daily and for you daily. So Christ is for the church. Then Paul says the church is for Christ. It's not only that Christ is for the church. Right, but he says the church is for Christ. Paul speaks about the church as Christ's body. Hallelujah. We are the body. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. In other words, listen to my notes. The church is central to God's great plans for the universe. <laughs> verse 10. Come on, let's go back to verse 10. Ephesians 1 and 10. Then in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. I wish I had more time because there's so much. I told you there's enough meat in that one verse. I could spend about three hours just pulling out in that verse. Listen, this is why we got to get into, word, into the word of there is so much richness in God's, in God's word. So he says, listen, uh, listen to my notes. Paul is saying also that these plans aren't just huge cosmic plans mm -hmm, that have nothing to do with us, uh, but, but, but God included us in his plans. Hallelujah. His, his plans have a special focus on the church. That's why you got to stay in the church. You got to stay in him because there he has special plans for his church. Hallelujah. He has plans for his church. He has plans. My Lord, put it in the comment section. Hashtag God has plans for his church. And that's the same thing as saying he has plans for me. As long as I'm within the beloved. He has planned and it shall come to pass. Whatever he has planned for us, it's coming to pass. So he's fulfilling his plans through us for the entire universe. So he has a special purpose for us, special plans for us. That's an amazing truth for those of us who didn't even know that. An amazing, you mean you have all these plans for me? You, you're going to use me to do things beyond my comprehension. You've been faithful. Listen, over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many. I can't wait to find out what the fulfillment of that scripture is all about. Hallelujah. My God. So he's talking to us about the church. Let's talk about the church. And he's, he's giving us probably some of the most important things. Christ is the head. Christ is for the church and the church is for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We exist especially to make him great. And I'm not saying that as if to say he wasn't great before us. He was already great. But I and you you and I are the manifestation of, of his greatness. Hallelujah. His plans are great. His will is great. His desires are great. And I was in his will. I was in his desire. Hallelujah. And that's why it is incumbent upon me to stay in his will. Stay in his will. And that what he desires becomes my desire. So I could receive everything 
that he wants me to have and be everything he wants me to be. So I got to stay in his body, stay in his church. And he says, everything is summed up in Christ. Everything, my future, glory, my future is wrapped up in him. All things are summed up in Jesus Christ. Listen, listen to my notes. It also tells us that the church is a heavenly reality. It's not just a reality down here, but the way Paul is talking, it's a heavenly reality also. Christ is now risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead and he has accomplished what he set out to do. What did he set out to do? To lay a path of salvation for you and for I. And he went on up into glory to show himself. I did it. Hallelujah. He showed the angels his hands. Glory to God. He showed the angels the nails in his hands. The, 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 he showed them the side. I did it. I took the blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. I did it. And because I live, they can live also. So it's a heavenly reality. He accomplished what he set out to do. He died and he rose again. No man takes my life. I'm going to lay it down. And on the third day, I'm going to get up again. Hallelujah. He would show himself in between then and his ascension. He would show himself to his disciples, to his followers. But then he would finally ascend and sit on the right hand of the Father. So it's a heavenly reality. Hallelujah. Christ is now risen. Heavenly reality. And because of what he did, he gave the church a song that the angels cannot listen. Only people who are really in the church and the church is in him have a right to sing this song. What song are you talking about? I've been redeemed. I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. Hallelujah. The angels marvel when we sing that song. Glory. Hallelujah. They look at us. And marvel when the saints come together to worship, the angels come among us. Hallelujah. God had to remind me of that because, you know, we've been in this pandemic and I've been coming into an empty building preaching just me and the technician. Sometimes you're kind of sitting in here with me and I'm I'm preaching or teaching. Uh, and the Lord had to remind me, listen, when the gospel is coming out of your mouth, even when you begin to praise and even when you begin to talk about my blood and my sacrifice, the angels come down. Hallelujah. Because it's a wonder to them. Hallelujah. For somebody to stand up and say, I've been washed. I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. They marvel at this salvation. And the church, a living, breathing organism, the body of Christ. Hallelujah. So we can't make sense of this in our flesh. Oh, God. But just thinking about this is a reality here on earth. And it's a reality even in heaven. Lord, I feel like having church. So listen to my notes and I'm getting ready to close. Christ is not just an institution or a community, or an organization. And I'm saying this for a reason, because uh, people are so lined up and so attached to organizations, so attached to denominations and institutions. And sure, I understand being proud. I'm very proud of, of the Reformation that I'm a part of. But what sense would it make for me to do all of this bragging about an organization that I'm attached to or a community that I'm attached to and I'm separated from the organism? Glory to God. So I've got to understand the church. I've got to understand the makings of the church, the components of the church. It is purposeful. It is future focused and it's a heavenly reality. And because it is the fulfillment of a risen Christ who is now ruling in heavenly realms. Oh, yes. And he has seated me, an old little short Gentile. He has taken me despite the opinions of demons and principalities. Despite all that they could have used against me, he washed all of that away and put me in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I'm in his body. 
I'm a part of this church. And it doesn't mean, hallelujah, that um, it doesn't mean that, that I should get so heavily weighted and so excited about it, an organization. My excitement and my joy should be more so attributed to the fact that I was disconnected at one time. And God has put me in his body. Hallelujah. So the church is the body of Christ. I'm in his body. He is the head. Christ is for the church. And the church is for Christ. Let's talk about the church. There's a whole lot more we can say. Glory to God. There's a whole lot more we can say about the church. Hallelujah. And you may have even more questions. Hallelujah. There's a whole lot we can say about this church, about the people, about the family gatherings. We can talk about the community and the leadership and the structures, the priorities, the mission. All of this matters. But this is not the first thing. Paul says the first thing you need to understand that is all in him. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Christ. It's all about him. It's all about Christ. Christ is for the church. And the church is for Christ. I'm going to stop. I, and I, I, I'm going to stop, but I really don't want to. But I'm going to stop. I'm gonna, listen, I'm going to close my iPad so I don't say no more. Hallelujah. And I already know. Listen, I said this was going to be three parts, but I need to jump to a fourth part. I want to, and, and there's so much about the church I can, I can talk about, but I want to extend a little bit more about the body of Christ, about the body of Christ. So I'm going to make a part four. Let's talk about the church. I'm going to, I'm going to start in chapter one, and I'm going to elaborate further on the body of Christ. Is that all right? So stick with me. That'll be what we, I'm letting you know already what we're going to be talking about next week. We're going to be extending the body of Christ. Let's talk about the church, and I'll go back into the body of Christ. I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for giving me this time. I don't take it for granted. I love you all so much, and I want to give a special shout out, of course, to the saints of God here at Greater Refuge Temple and at Refuge Temple Annex, and... Uh, the Lord has been blessing us. I want to do a special shout out to those of you who have connected with us out in Jamaica. I don't mean Jamaica, Queens. I mean uh, Jamaica. Yeah, uh, the country, that, that island, Jamaica. Uh, and those of you who I've been in contact with and who have been uh, conversing with me, you've connected with us and our worship on Sundays and Bible studies out in the Philippines the Lord bless you. Um, and in Canada, uh, California, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, all over this nation, people are sending me emails and inboxing me uh, who have been tying in uh, to us. I'm grateful to the Lord for this fellowship. Uh, and I pray that the Lord has been blessing you. I want to pray a special prayer. Yeah, because there may be someone who's listening and uh, you have a special need in your life. I want to pray for you. And if you want to send me a request, you may do so. Send it to admin at grtdc.org. And someone in my staff, uh, they'll make sure that I receive it so I can add it to the prayer list and lay it on the altar uh, as I pray. I want to thank you. Uh, for connecting with us, and I want to continue being a blessing. Uh, even those of you in Have a De Grace who have connected uh, and uh, other parts of New York, I'm hearing from you, and I'm grateful to the Lord for what he is doing. I want to pray for you. Yes, I want to pray. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word, and I thank you for everyone who has connected with us. Hallelujah. You know what they need. You know their hearts and minds. You know every problem. You know the prayers they've been praying. I pray that you make it so. Healing and deliverance, salvation. In the name of Jesus, if they're not connected, Father, bring them in. Hushanda, in the name of Jesus. Bless her, bless him. Save her, save him. 
Heal, Lord. Bless the whole house, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to be baptized? Send that in to me. Send me a request and we'll make that connection. We will make sure that you are baptized into that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. You have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost? Let me know. Send it to me. Admin at grtdc.org and someone from the staff will reach out to you and will tell you what you need to do to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yes, there are missionaries. There are the ministers and uh, counselors and we'll assign them to you uh, and we'll work with you, trusting and believing God that he will fill you with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. You need his power. You need his anointing. You need the indwelling of his spirit in your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. If you want to bless us, you want to plant seed in this ministry, you want to pay your tithes. Now listen, if you belong to a ministry already, pay your tithes to them. Pay your tithes. Don't eat here. Yeah, and, and don't take care of your shepherd and pay your tithes to where you belong. Uh, but if you don't have a church home and you want to pay tithes, uh, follow the instruction on the screen. Or uh, if you want to plant the seed, it's not a tithe, but it's a seed, uh, go on and plant. This is good soil. I promise you that this is good soil. Follow the instructions on the screen. And those of you who are in the New York area, our sister church, Refuge Temple Annex in the Bronx, you may use Givelify. The Lord bless you. I've taken enough of your time. But I declare the way I feel in my spirit, I'll take a text and I'll preach right in this office. God is good to me. Yes, he is. We're going to meet again if it's his will. And remember, we're going to continue this and we'll extend it as we talk more about the body of Christ. But in between now and then, there are three things that I'd like you to do. And you know, it's to be careful, be prayerful, and be holy. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>